Morning. Uh, so as you know, we've been going through a series uh, called What is it worth? Right? And we're thinking about uh, what are specific things in our lives worth to us and how does that affect our relationship with God, our relationship with other people and community. Um, and I want to start, today we're going to be talking about uh, what is your point of view worth? Right? How much are your opinions worth? Uh, the things that you think are important, um, how important? Are they to you? Are they like too important that they're you know hindering you from other things, or are they just important enough? And that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, I want to start by asking you to think about um, an old car, just in your head. Think about an old car, whatever that means to you. Uh, think about that. Think about the color. Think about what it looks like. How dirty is it? How rusty is it? Or not rusty? I don't want to influence your image, but you know whatever. Just be very specific in your in your car there. Got it? Okay, um, so how many of you thought of something that looks something similar to the first picture that will be coming up in a second there? Um, how many of you, just raise your hand, if it's somewhat close to that? Yeah. No? <laughs> okay. Uh, what about the second one? Like that? Uh, closer? Okay, all right. And what about the third one? How many of you would say that's, that's an Oscar? Okay. Nice. So, okay, most people. So the second and third. No one went that old on the first one. Okay. Oh, you did. You did. All right. There you go. <laughs> Ross is like, mine is falling apart. It's just, yeah. Um, so this shows um, how we, dif we have different points of view, right? Like, just, just saying an old car. Even if I said a red old car, like, you would still think of different things, right? To some of you, if it's a 2015, you're like, that needs to be replaced ASAP. It's old, right? The lease is over. Give me a new one. Uh, some of you, it's like, well, I can still drive it. It's not too old, right? I'm, it's still getting me somewhere, so it, it, it's fine. So this is just one example of different points of view, different perspectives, right? Our frame of reference, our, our, where we stand and how we see this. So we want to think about how much is that worth, right? This point of view. And we're going to look at a couple of events that happened in the life of Peter, uh, the apostle in the early church, right, and see what we can learn from some of his experiences and experiences of the other apostles. And I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 10, uh, starting on verse 9. If you have your Bible, if not, you can share. Um, Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. Give you guys a second. Yeah, Acts chapter 10, verse 9 through 16. Cool. So if you're using the app and you want to switch, I'm using the English Standard Version, ESV, if you want to follow along. Um, <laughs> you can follow along on the other ones. Jack has the iPhone 5, so I'll give her a second. Uh, <laughs> so do I. <laughs> All right, uh, verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is, un that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, God. It's always a privilege to find these gems and these things that you're teaching us, God, through scripture. Uh, we thank you because um, in your sovereign will, you allow us to have the Bible as we have it today. And God, we ask that you would speak to us through these words, God. I ask that your spirit would minister to each of our hearts, God, and that we may uh, be challenged and that we may be um, encouraged to grow in our walk with you, God. I ask that everything that I say may glorify you uh, and edify and build up my brothers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So based on this passage and a couple others that we're going to look at, uh, there are four things that we're going to talk, think about uh, regarding points of view, right? The first truth is that we all have our points of view and perspectives, right? We have opinions, right? And that's, and that's a good thing. 
right? God didn't create a bunch of robots, right? He created us with the mind, and he wants us to have opinions. He doesn't want us to be like, ah, whatever. Isn't that annoying when you know somebody and everything is like, whatever. What do you want to do for lunch? Ah, uh, whatever. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> I'm not pointing fingers. Uh, you know, okay, so God wants us to have opinions, right? And that could be a personality thing, right? You go along with whatever. Uh, but he wants us to have our convictions, right, and our, our points of view. And it may seem obvious, but it's important and it's healthy to realize that we have points of view. Or you may be like, well, duh. But a lot of people don't get that. They think, like, what they think must be it, period. Like, everyone must follow me and think like I do, and that's not even a conversation, right? Uh, and that's, that's unhealthy. So what's going on in this text, right? The early church is taking off. Peter preached the sermon a little, a few weeks ago probably at this point, uh, and like 3,000 people, 3,000 men plus women and children, right, converted, and it's like this big thing going, and he's just really busy. Um, and then he was hungry. He sits up there on the roof. Uh, he's hungry. Mind you, he's not helping prepare the food, right? He's just being a man about it, sitting up there waiting for the meal. Um, and then he falls into this trance. Um, so it's clear that it's not, it, it didn't physically happen to him, right? It's like an image, it's a vision, uh, but the, the Bible describes it as a trance. And then he sees a bunch of animals, right? And the, the, the thing he uses, the reptiles, birds, and whatever, that three categories represents all animals, right? That's the same expression used in Noah with the ark, right? So like every kind of animal is there, right? So you just imagine this must have been a big sheet. Uh, and then this voice comes from, he from heaven and says, kill and eat. Um, and now... The Jewish laws were particularly detailed about pretty much everything, right? Like what you can wear, what you can eat, what you can't eat. And then if you're really curious, Leviticus chapter 11, Leviticus 20, verse 25, that's where this is. Like it's very specific rules, right, on what God's people was supposed, were supposed to eat and not eat. Now, on top of that, the religious leaders, they came up with more laws, right? They had good intentions. They said, well, let's interpret this, right, and bring it to our day-to-day. -day. So if you see in the New Testament, there's parts where, like, Jesus doesn't wash his hands or something before he eats, and they get all, like, worked up about it. That's an example, right? That's a law that they came up with, a custom that they brought into uh, their community. And that's, so that's, that's where Peter grew up, right? That's his mindset. That's, like, the context that he grew up in. Right? There's these rules, um, they have a, a divine source, right? and they understand all these other rules to be interpretations and building upon those first rules. So keep that in mind. Uh, so Peter had very clear convictions. Right? We know that uh, in the Bible that he was a very opinionated individual. Right? When he's hanging out with Jesus, he'll just like, ah! He'll just like, say things, like no filter. You know, Peter is just the guy, and he has opinions. Um, and he was very hungry here. But even then, he's just very quick to be like, no, I can't do that. By no means. No, God, I can't do that. Right? So he had his firm conviction. Now, thinking about Peter for a second, we all have our points of view and our, our convictions for a reason, right? Or many reasons, really, right? We're shaped by our decisions, right? You could have said, well, I think about this this way because one day I thought about this and I reasoned through it, I studied, I read, and whatever, and I formed my point of view based on this decision. Right? It was a conscious effort to, to decide and to, to build that. Uh, it could be your background, right? Maybe depending on your family of origin, how you grew up, what experiences you went through. All that shapes your point of view, right? your opinions. Uh, it could also be just customs. Right? And there's customs where you, know, you just do a thing a certain way because that's how it's done, period. Right? Uh, it could be just because that's how it was always done. I never thought about it, and I'm just going to keep uh, doing it. And just a side note. And this is why we keep talking about, you know, why do, we, why do we do what we do, right? That's been coming up, if you notice, last few weeks, last couple of months. We want what we do as a church, as a community, the reason that we gather together to worship, the reason that we meet in cell groups, the reason why we serve in the worship team, that we do anything, to be a conscious decision, to be like, I do this because I have thought through it, and God deserves this, and I'm going to serve in this way because of X, Y, and Z. Right? We don't want it to be just customs. Right? We don't want to be religious people. We don't want to just be doing the same thing. And that's why we keep emphasizing that. Um, and our customs could also be based on some external authority. Right? If you're a kid uh, and your parents always told you to do this this way, you may just grow up doing that that way, and then you'll be like, why do you do that? Well, I don't know, because my mom used to tell me to do it that way. Right? And that's just how, that's how it is. And that's fine, too. And that's, that's the context of Peter. Right? The reason he's saying, I'm not going to eat those animals, is not because he didn't like reptiles as weird as that is, uh, but because God told them not to do it, right? There's an external authority that told God's people do this and don't do that. Now, 
Over the years and centuries, many have tried to say that one of these things shape our point of view. Or there's some extremes. They'll say, oh, it's all, about, it's all about the family origin. That pretty much programs you for the rest of your life and you just follow along. Then there's like the rational side where it's like, no, it's all the decisions, right? You could override anything, any experience. But there seems to be a general consensus that it's a combination, right? It's not one. It's nature and nurture thing. It's, it's really both. The question is how much of each, right? But they're both, they're both there. So it's important to realize that what we think or how we understand a situation is based on our point of view. Life, like I said, will be much more difficult if we don't understand this. Right? It's going to be really uh, frustrating. And it's a, a challenge to all of us, but some people struggle with this more than others. Um, and here's, here's a, a way to know, right? Um, if you're in some sort of conflict or you know, trying to like, work through a situation, can you put yourself in the other person's shoes? Can you say, let me try to understand why he or she is doing that? That's the first step, right? If you're like, nope, I'm right, the wrong period, then it may be that you, what I'm trying to say is understanding that the way we see things is our point of view, right? If you can't even like, put yourself in the other person's shoes, that, that's already a no. Then that's not a lost cause. That just means you've got to work on that, right, or think about that. Now, you're like, well, I do put myself in the other person's shoes, but they, I can't believe they think this, and they said this because of that. And if you, could, if you could claim to know their motives and the reason why they do everything, and they're always wrong, there's a good chance that you're still not understanding that what you see is your point of view. Does that make sense? Right? If you're like, no, I see their point of view, but they're always wrong, then maybe you don't really you know, see their, their point of view. And that's what I'm trying to get at. So first truth is that we all have our point of view and our perspective. Second, um, there are situations where our point of view needs to be adjusted, right? There are times when change is needed, right? Change is just part of life, right? That just happens all the time. And in this passage, uh, Peter's challenged to change his point of view in a pretty radical way, right? We, ju we just talked about this. He was a Jewish man who followed these customs, right? It was ingrained in him. It was just part of his identity. Uh, and then God tells him to do something that he didn't think he was supposed to do. And his response is really quick, right? By no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So Peter had his convictions. He had his point of view. And like I said, you could argue that it's a solid point of view. It was based on what God told his people, right? It wasn't just his preference, right? He was following uh, the instructions he had received. But the challenge to Peter here, it's not just to eat weird animals, right? The challenge for, that God has for him is, are you willing to move beyond your point of view? Right? Are you willing to go, you know, this is where I am now? Are you willing to consider a change, right, an adjustment? And that's what God proposes to him. So our, our points of view, they can't be unchangeable, right? They can't be like, this is it, and, and it's never going to change. And you, you, you may know somebody that's like this. It's like, well, I've always thought this way. Um, so no, that person's wrong, right? It's like, okay, well, did you ever consider changing? Nope, that's just how it's always been, and that's how it's going to be, right? So that's a point of view that's not changing. So, you know, that's not healthy. Um, now, our previous pastor, Pastor Calisto, he used to say this, um, you need to have your convictions, right? Have your convictions, think through things, and then write them down. But write them down with pencil, because, you know, the idea is you may need to adjust them, right? So have something. Don't just be like, ah, uh, I don't know, God, Jesus, whatever. You know, no, like have your firm convictions, but realize that they may need to be tweaked in some way. And we know from the, later in the text that Peter's opinion did change, Right? And we see the results of this. So here's what's going on. Before he goes on the rooftop and you know, passes out or whatever, um, there is a man named Cornelius, awesome name for a cat, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Right, Cornelius? Yeah. So God tells this man to go look for Peter. Um, and the next day, Peter does meet this man, finally. Right? And he gives them his, this is like his, uh, you know, Peter's like warm response to the guy. Just imagine this. He says, you know yourselves how unlawful it is for Jews to associate with, with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then, why you sent for me? <laughs> so Peter's like, hey, you're not Jewish, but, um, you know, God told me to not stay away from you. So I'm here. What do you want? <laughs> that's his, like, you know, nice, warm Peter here. Uh, and that's, that's what we get from him. But we see that he came, right? So the next day, he's already applying. And this is, if you're curious, on 
verse 28, either the same chapter or the next chapter. Um, and then in chapter 11, Peter's telling the, the disciples what happened, right? So this is important to, to Luke, right, the author, because he, he tells us like a couple of different times, and now Peter's going to repeat this whole story to, to his friends, and he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, uh, this is 11, starting in 15, and on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them, the non-Jews, as he gave them to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should stand in God's way? So that's a little more uh, firm, right? He's saying, so the, the after effect, after the what do you want thing, uh, he, he talked to them and he preached to them and he saw the Holy Spirit acting in their lives. And then his conclusion was, wow, like if God is willing to do that, my preferences, my frame of mind, right, my religion can't stand in the way of what God's trying to do, right? And Peter realized that and he changed that. So there are times when our point of view will need to be adjusted. And there's times where this happens naturally or organically, right? If you go through something terrible, like a big loss, you lose someone you love, um, it's very possible that your perspective, your, your view on life itself will change, right? Um, I don't know if this happened to you guys, but like when you suffer something big, like you lose something big, uh, there's a change, right? You start prioritizing things, your outlook on life, your point of view changes, and that kind of happens as a result of the event. But sometimes it has to be an intentional effort, right? It has to be, okay, um, I have this point of view, and I think I need to make some tweaks here, right? And the, the key to this is having a prayerful attitude, right? Coming to God and saying, God, ultimately, you're the one that can change me, right? Otherwise, it's just behavior modification, right? You're not changing my heart. You're not changing my mind. So coming to God in a humble way and saying, God, help me work through this. And there's no, like, checklist, right? You can't be like, well, I'm going to do this, this, talk to this person, and then I'm going to change my mindset or my point of view, right? It, it's more than that. And God is the one that guides us through that. But many times, it comes down to identifying at least one part of it, why we have a point of view, right? Like, is it my family that is shaping the, the way I think about this? Is it, you know, that friend I had that did this and that to me? That's why I think about friendships this way? Or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, but we, we ask God, and in Peter's case, it was quick, right? Literally the next day, he had to put it into practice already, right? One day he's learning the animals thing, and the next day God's like, hey, go talk to this guy. And he did, right? And he learned from that right away. So we'll all have situations where our point of view and our opinions need to be adjusted, changed, or altogether discarded. Be like, this doesn't work for me anymore. Now, personally, I don't like change, if you know me. Um, and I've tried this before. Like, I, I came up with this idea, like, two years ago. I said, um, Jackie, <laughs> I know, she's scratching her head. Um, we're going to go through one big change a year. That's it. Right? We graduated from seminary this year. No more big changes. We're n <laughs> nope, nope, no buying car, no changing this, no changing that. Um, so uh, for a while, it was like graduation, marriage, you know, like I try to kind of do one thing, but that doesn't work. Life, life doesn't work that way, right? Change is just, you know, part of life, and they seem to all come together yeah, at the same time, yeah. But there are times when we need to decide um, to make changes, and there's times we'll be forced to make changes, right? But... It's never easy. Maybe somebody loves change. I don't know. I don't want to generalize. Yeah, so, okay. See, that's my point of view. My point of view is change is tough. But some people may be like, I don't know, I could live anywhere every week. Um, but just understanding that these changes will come up is helpful, right? Just expecting them, right? If you're watching a scary movie, um, this is how I do it. I, I just always anticipate the next thing. I'm like, ah, he's going to come out from there. Ah. So, so eventually when it happens, I'm not scared because I already saw it coming, right? <laughs> Except I scare myself more than the movie does. <laughs> but, you know, just expecting those changes um, helps. So we all have our points of view. We all come across situations where our point of view needs to be changed. Third, we will have to work with people that have different points of view. <sighs> this, is the, this is the tough one, right? Um, none of us live in a bubble unless you're a bubble boy, um, reference to the 90s. Um, and your deeply held convictions uh, can't prevent you from interacting with other people, right? Uh, Peter himself had to do this in the early church, right? Think about this. The church, the church itself was growing super fast, right? He had to deal with all kinds of people, right? People who thought this, people who thought that. Um, and in Acts 15, if you want to fast forward a little bit, um, we're going to look at a, an episode that happens there. So this is... 
for anyone that's remotely interested in church history, uh, this is the first sort of church council, right? So the church itself has many councils over the years where all the bishops and everybody gather and whatever. This is considered the first one, right? The council in Jerusalem. So there's this big issue. They come to the apostles and say, hey, there's a big problem. We need to figure this out, right? And they all sit together. So Acts 15, uh, starting in verse 1, and we'll, we'll skip a few, but just follow along or listen along. Acts 1, uh, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers Unless you were circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Skip down to verse 6. The apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up, same Peter we're talking about, stood up and said, Brothers, I know that in the early days... God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. This is what we're talking about, right? He was preaching to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. Uh, verse 8, and God knows the heart, uh, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke uh, on the neck of the disciples, that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we've been saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus as they will. Amen. Uh, verse 13, so he, let's just pause here for a second. So he, there's this debate, right? Some people, the, it starts with some men. That's never a good sign, right? Some men came down and were teaching this. Um, and then they come to the, to the disciples and the apostles and say, um, there is this problem. And Peter is quick. He gets up and he says, okay, here's my stance, right? He's like, I, I saw it happening, right? I preached to the Gentiles. I saw the Holy Spirit doing his thing, and, and it was awesome. And I, we're saved by, the, by, our, by grace through faith, right? And that's it. And he just like lays that out there. Now, James replies in verse 13, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with the words of the prophets, agree just that is written. And then he quotes like an Old Testament prophecy where, you know, he believes is justifying his argument that, you know, all can be included uh, through Jesus. Seven, 19, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been uh, strangle, strangled and from blood. Now, from this episode, we'll learn a couple more things, right, about point of view. The biggest of which is that um, we will come across situations where people think differently than us, right? The whole reason they had this gathering is because people were thinking differently. Some people were saying they do not need to become Jewish. They just accept Jesus, and they're straight in. Uh, or they need to become Jewish, therefore they become Christian, because that's, you know, the way things go. Now, um, we saw in the earlier passage that Peter understood that God didn't want these restrictions, right, for people to, to reach Jesus. Um, some men had this different position, and I love how it says that Paul had no small debate with them. Like, if you read Paul, he could get, you know, pretty feisty in his words, and just imagine him having no small debate with them. Like, you know, it must have been quite uh, a scene, and then he's like, you know what, we're going to bring this to the apostles, and they, and they come up. Um, so what do we learn from this? Per, uh, Peter was firm in establishing his position, right? He had a clear opinion. He wasn't like, I don't know, Maybe they do, maybe they don't. He was like, no, this is how I understand it, right? And then what follows? There's this awkward silence. It's a silence fell upon the room or whatever. Um, and then James comes forward with this compromise, right? Peter says, he takes what Peter proposed. He looks at scripture. He thinks about how he sees things. And he says, okay, how about this? Let's just tell them to abstain from food from idols, to, you know, not be sexually immoral, and, and, and we'll just give them those, uh, those rules. So what does this mean to us? There's times where our point of view needs to be changed. That's what we talked about before. But there's also times where our point of view needs to be established, and we need to be firm and say, no, this is, this is my point of view. Not out of a stubborn heart, but out of like a convicted, like, no, this is, this is what I believe. I truly believe this is it, right? And then the compromise needs to be a possibility, right? Because if, it, if it's, no, this is what I believe, and that's it, then your heart's not in the right place already. Then you're thinking, well, I'm absolutely right. Everyone else is absolutely wrong. Therefore, it must be this, right? So there is a place for having firm convictions, but even in that, we have to be willing to work with people who are different than us, right, who think differently than we do. And the fourth truth, finally, 
Um, our point of view cannot be valued more than the truth of the gospel. Now, as I'm going through these, some of you may have picked up on this. Because um, when it comes to point of view, uh, there's a big danger in relativizing everything. What does that mean? In making everything relative, right? Like, oh, truth is relative. What is true to you? I mean, you know, it's not true to me. And I think this is good, and you think that's good, and that's fine. You know, let's, let's not talk about it. And the postmodern tendency or, or philosophical sort of place where we live and culture is, is that, right? Like, you have your own, I have my own, and maybe we'll talk about the things we agree and, like, be happy about it. It's like, oh, yes, we agree on this, but we're not going to go to the places where we differ, right? We're not going to... We're not going to get into that. Let's just, you know, be nice and, and get along. And now, it's true that we should be loving of people who think differently than us. That's not even a Christian principle. That's just being a decent human, right? Like, someone thinks differently than you, you treat them well, right? Still. But just as Peter stated his conviction, as Christians, we are not shy to say that we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the man who lived over 2,000 years ago, is the Son of God, and that the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, that kind of statement is not popular today, right? If you, if you say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, you have to confess that Jesus is Lord to be saved, right? That's not the kind of thing that's popular. And um, just a side note, there's um, Presbyterian Church, um, USA, BC USA. So they had a conflict almost 100 years ago at this point where the reason the, the guy that founded the seminary I go to, uh, he was like, wait, this, this doesn't sound too good, right? So they used to have this missions board, right? That their purpose is to organize missions to preach the gospel to the world. Um, they're around for like a couple hundred years. And then in the early 1900s, they start to sort of reshape the mission of the mission board, right? They started making it like, okay, well, missionaries, you know, they have to work with the culture and just, you know, a betterment of life and like improve life, human flourishing, and, like, you know, if it just means, like, helping them economically, we're just going to help them dig wells, right? And the Jesus, the heaven and hell thing, now we're past that, right? We're, gonna, we're just going to focus on making people's lives here better. That's not the gospel, right? That's not what the Bible teaches us to do. And there was a big conflict, as you could imagine. The church split there, and it was a big thing. Um, but that's the kind of conviction that, you know, can't be put below our point of view, right? It can be that our point of view is preventing us or maybe preventing you from embracing the most important truth of all time, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Savior. And there is a place for point of view in Christianity, right? Churches, like, we have points of view all the time, right? There are things that the Bible is not directly specific on, and we interpret and we have our points of view, right? That's why we have Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists. We're not saying they're not Christian. We're saying, well, this is our point of view, and that's their point of view. And unless they're contradicting the fact that Jesus is Lord and the central truths of the Bible, we're not going to say they're not Christian, right? But we have points of view. So there is room for points of view. We're not saying we're all going to be, like, you know, thinking the same about everything. But the possibility that Jesus is Lord, that he is the real deal, can't be based on our point of view, right? Um, we're all entitled to our point of view. You may think that every religion is a lie, that, you know, there is no God, and this can be based on your background, your decisions, your customs, all those things that we talked about. Uh, you may think that Jesus is not the only way, right? Maybe there's many ways to God. Um, or that Christians are narrow-minded and, you know, stubborn and prejudiced, and to which we would say, amen, they are. A lot of them are, right? We're not going to argue with that. But my encouragement to you is consider, to consider whether your point of view is keeping you from at least considering that this Jesus thing may be the real deal, right? And I'm not going to assume that just because you go to church, just because you grew up in the church, that you, that you truly believe this, right? We can't make that assumption. So, you know, is it possible, just to consider this, that your point of view is keeping you from embracing that truth, right? Paul, who wrote a good portion of the New Testament, um, he was, like, exceptionally educated, very sophisticated. He had all the credentials, all the titles, right? He was, the, even before he was Christian, he had all of these, like, merits. And this is what he says um, after he comes to Jesus and he gets to know the truth of the gospel. In Philippians 3, starting on verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This is the guy who had, like, everything, right? Like, we don't know that he was rich, but he, he was probably decent, right? And he, he had all these credentials, all these titles. He's probably Dr. Paul, if he was today, right? Um, and he says, 
I count all of that as loss, right? That's meaningless. Just like in light of Jesus, in light of like, you know, how big a deal this is, that's nothing. And he says, for his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So, again, my, ch- my, my challenge is, is, is your point of view keeping you from considering God or from considering something that God is trying to do in your life? Right? Is it possible that God's trying to lead you a certain way and you're like, well, that doesn't match up with how I think, so it must not be God, right? And it must not be true. Um, Paul says later in, well, yeah, in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, for though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I may win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I may with those under the law, sorry, that I may win those under the law. Verse 21, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I wasn't, wasn't outside the law. He has this whole like parentheses all the time. Uh, that I may win those who are outside the law. To the weak, I became weak. Um, I become all things to all people, that by any, all means I may save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them, share, share them in its blessings. So Paul saying, I have all of these things. I could have been a professor. I could have been at this university and like, you know, sat there and like, taught about Jesus because, you know, I'm the Jewish guy who got converted and I am smart and I have all the titles. But he's saying, I moved beyond that. I moved, I had to move, be, I chose to, and I enjoyed moving beyond my point of view, beyond my mindset, my usual thing. To, I've become all things to all people. He's like, I'll do anything. There's a church that says, we'll do anything short of sin to reach people from Christ. And there's some danger there, but you get the idea, right? Like I've, I've done uncomfortable things because my goal is to bring people to Christ, right? Um, so is your point of view at least keeping you from exploring the possibility that the gospel is true? This truth surpasses all our opinions and our points of view. It's something that we engage on with our minds, but ultimately that's faith, right? We accept that Jesus is Lord uh, by faith and the faith that God gives us, right? It's not something that we have in ourselves, that we generate in ourselves, but it's that we ask God, help me have this faith um, to believe this. Now, if you're already a follower of Jesus, um, how is your opinion of him affecting your life and community? Right? Are you resisting serving in some way, a church or a ministry or something like that, because of your point of view? Are you saying, well, that ministry, they do this this way. I don't know. I'm not going to get involved because I don't agree. Right? I don't like the songs your own chooses. I'm not going to play because that's my point of view. We shouldn't be doing that. Right? Um, is your point of view keeping you from serving God? Is it keeping you from living this authentic community that we want to live Right? Is it keeping you from a cell group? And you're thinking like, oh no, those things don't work. That's my point of view is, no, we've been there. That's not going to work. Is that your point of view? And that's keeping you from having these awesome experiences with other people. Um, our prayer needs to be that God would shape our point of view. Because like I said, he's the only one that can really change us. Right? Our point of view that's focused on God, on what Jesus is doing in his church, and how we can get on board. Right? The church is moving forward. Right? The church is not this. It's not even just us. Right? It's, it's Jesus is church and he's doing this big thing and he's calling us to jump on board and get along and we're foolish if we're just like no i don't i don't think so i don't i don't like that i don't like this we're just being grumpy old men no offense to any grumpy old men um but that's not what god wants us to have so he wants us to have a heart that's uh willing to be shaped and changed so that's our prayer um let's pray for us god we thank you for this challenge that that we get from your word, God. We thank you because you've created us with a rational mind that is able to have these opinions and we're able to reason through things. And it's such a gift. And we ask that you can help us to use those things for your glory, God. That you would help us to have uh, firm convictions based on the truth of your scripture, on, on your revelation through Jesus, God. Um, that it may be, they may be concrete and real in our lives, God, but that we may not be stubborn or unwilling to understand other people, God. God, we don't want to be narrow-minded, annoying Christians, but we want to be true Jesus followers that will hang out with the people that Jesus would have hung out with, God. 
We want to talk to the people that Jesus would have gone out of his way to talk to. And it's uncomfortable. It's, it's hard, uh, but we, we commit our lives to you and we ask you to help us to not put our point of view above you and above what you're trying to do in our lives, God. God, we thank you and we ask you to help us this week as we uh, pray for our church, as we pray for the vision of reaching people, God, for you, the vision of multiplying and growing, God, and being a healthy church. And we, we ask that you can help us and that you can show us any place where our point of view is hindering us from serving you, God. God, help us and convict us this week, God, especially as we're not distracted by social media. I ask that you speak to us, God, and that you be clear and challenge us, God. We want to grow, and even if it's painful, we ask you to guide us through that process. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.